Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. We give God praise and glory for another time of fellowship. Amen to Jesus. I believe we are blessed by the, the time of fellowship from last week, Friday. Uh, like we know, this is um, the fasting and prayer of our ministry in this month of uh, October. By the grace of God, the first month of every quarter, we give it unto the Lord in the fast as the Lord has directed us. And um, every quarter that we have done this this year, we've seen God do great and mighty things. I believe God for great things in this last quarter. But the Bible says, better is the end of the matter than the beginning. So believe God for the better things. And so in the course of this fasting and this prayer meetings, we trust God for his presence and his glory. We had a good kickoff on Friday, which was the 1st of October. And we're continuing today. The fastings run through the weekdays. And uh, we stream online, preaching God's word and praying through the weekdays. Amen to Jesus. I trust God for a great time today. And I believe you are prepared for God's word. And you are prepared uh, to pray also. Amen to Jesus. Glory to God forevermore. Hallelujah. Let's just go ahead and bless the name of the Lord. Give him praise and glory. Give him honor and thanks. Give him bless his name. Glorify him. He is good and his mercy is endure forever. He clingles kibranti kratatsa. Batu yatatsi bradalatsu atalanta. Empi kente geden shegen enswa. Rami kutavali atatsu atalanta. Rabatu only God Yes, 
Zion's King. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are my only throne. Lord, we worship you. Exalt and extol you. We give you the praise and the glory because you deserve it all. Sweet Holy Spirit, the Lord, come in the Jesus. We glorify you, our Father, we extol you. Be eternal. Take all the glory and praise because you deserve it all. Yes, so you be the praise and glory. Glorify Jesus in this meeting, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord and King. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah, Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are in for the same time. A glorious time with God's presence today again. Amen to Jesus. We yeah, understand of last week on our, our God's word to us for this month. This month of October, the Lord told us two months ago is a, is, a month of, is a month of restoration. And actually, when God gives us a word, He actually gives us a word not for the month in quote alone, you know, but for a season. Amen. And also, a build up of so many seasons. Amen. Gives birth to what? A year. Praise God forevermore. Yeah. It, um, three, four, uh, uh, the Western one, we have four seasons in, in our. In our, in our, in our uh, African location, we have like literally two seasons the rainy season and the dry season. Amen. To do that, then the hammer time. Amen. To do that, the build up of all this season uh, gives birth to what they call a year. And when God begins to give us words and words, the seasons are building up. And before you know, a year comes up. And then we begin to call it the year of his favor. We call it the Jubilee. Are we together? Because the Jubilee is a build up of 49 years. Amen. Then the 50th year, and everything explodes, explodes. Amen. So when God gives you a word for a season, um, pray the word, study the word, digest the word. In quote, sometimes it may look like physically you are not seeing the manifestation, but that does not mean you should be just right and why? Because the build up of seasons brings about a year. And what I'm talking about the year, we're talking about the year of the Jubilee, where all the worlds of God are built up for a period. And then it comes hitting you heavy. Amen. So we thank God for this word again, the season of restoration. Amen. And we'll be studying on restore all things. Amen. Last week we started off studying on restore all things and we understood the place of um, um, the, the, the transfiguration. And we understood that um, we are in the season of transfiguration. And the transfiguration is what brings about the awakening. And the Church of Jesus needs an awakening like never before now. And the only thing that will bring about the awakening is the transfiguration experience where Jesus is glorified, where Jesus shines, where Jesus. He reveals himself to the church. Then the awakening comes. We learn that the disciples did not have to, Jesus didn't have to wake them during the transformation. They woke up by themselves when the when the act was going on. But in their ceremony, he had to wake them three times. Amen. And we understood that over the years we've been trying to wake Christians and wake Christians, and it looks like the waking up call is it's some of the time counterproductive. But when you try to do something like that, uh, and it seems like it's counterproductive, then you have to seek another way out. And that's why we are believing God for the greater awakening that will be heralded by the transfiguration experience where Jesus is revealed where Jesus is glorified when Jesus is glorified in his church again we discover that what happens the transfiguration act starts off and then the church is awakened amen Praise God. Hallelujah to Jesus. And that's why the devil fights everything that has to do with Jesus. He fights it like crazy because he knows that what Jesus is glorified is the transfiguration that is happening and then the church is awakened. Amen. And so we're continuing today and we're also on restore all things um, the second part. And today we're going to be, uh, now it's like um, the way that I prepare, um, the Holy Ghost prepares teachings for me. You have a heading, some heading and some, some heading. Um, so we just take it like that. Um, I'm not into the giving of beautiful titles like that. Take the title and get the understanding. That's the most important thing. All right, so we're going to be studying on the return of Elijah. The return of Elijah. Are we together? I don't know why the Lord is giving a focus on um, the spirit of Elijah and the mantle of John the Baptist because it's important for the time to live in. Amen. Matthew chapter 17, 10 remain the anchor scripture we used the last time. Matthew 17, verse 10 to 12 says, And the disciples asked him, saying, Why did they say the scribe that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come, shall first come, and restore all things. Why was Eli Elias come? And he replied them, why Elias must come? The reason why Elias must come is that he is coming to what? Restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him 
whatsoever they listed. Likewise also shall the Son of Man suffer of them. And if um, another um, verse says, and the disciples knew that he was talking about John the Baptist. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, so um, of the above scripture, we see that the scribes said that Elias must first come. He must first come. Um, this was why the presence of Elias caught the attention of the disciples in the mount during the transfiguration. Amen to Jesus. Now they said he must first come. The scribes had said Elias must first come. They knew that Elias must first come. And so when they saw Elias on the mount of transfiguration, it caught the attention. It caught the attention of the disciples because they knew that the scribes had spoken about this in the past. Amen to Jesus. Amen. Now if you see in the 12th verse of book, we see that John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus. Not only in his words, but also in his works. And also in the recognition of his person. Are we together? So John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus in his words, in his works, and in the recognition of the person of Jesus. Praise God forevermore. He also recognized the destiny of Jesus and he also recognized the ministry of Jesus. Praise God forevermore. And now this person, destiny and ministry was what both John and Jesus were meant to what? Suffer. Are we together? Now, John was one person that uh, understood the suffering of the Lord Jesus, even before the time of the Lord Jesus. Praise God forevermore. And um, John experienced the same rejection. Look at what Jesus was saying here. He said, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Amen. Same thing that John suffered, Jesus suffered. Same thing that Jesus was to suffer, John has suffered. So John was a man who understood the sufferings of Jesus. He understood the ministry of Jesus. This is speaking, he said, that if you also suffer with me, you also be what? Glorified with me. That if you suffer with me, you should also be what? Glorified with me. So there is a, uh, there is a, a revelation of the suffering of Jesus that John the Baptist understood. Amen to Jesus. And this suffering actually was, he was not known. Amen to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, the people did not know John and they did not know Jesus. And we see this truth about Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 10. He says, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He was in the world, the world was made by him and the world what? knew him not. The world didn't know him. Praise the Lord forevermore. Though the world was made by him. So the same challenge of not being known that John faced was the same that Jesus faced. Amen to Jesus. And this was something that was unique to both ministries. The ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus. Being amongst your own and not being known. Being in a location, being with the people and not still being known for who you are. Now that's not the greatest pain you can go through. I've been through it for years in ministry. I've gone through it for years in ministry. I've gone through it in life where you are around and people do not know you and they they have different all manner of definitions about you they have all manner of um, 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 ideologies and conclusions about you they, they people have their misgivings misunderstanding misorientation misrepresentations about you and it's one of the most painful thing to experience in life praise god forevermore now um if you look at jesus speaking he asked his disciples who do men say that i am and some say they say you're elijah some say you are john the baptist and he said okay who then who do you say i am now why was jesus doing this now he was not doing it because he was trying to get their opinion about him but he was trying to get their understanding of his, what men understand about him praise god forever that's not going to change his ideology he's not going to change his uh, his faith in himself he's not going to change his belief in himself in any way but now it makes it, it it paints a picture that in life on a on a general note people don't know people and they judge people on the knowledge they have about them and it's worse off in the pursuit of vision and the pursuit of purpose. Praise God forevermore. When you are pursuing vision, when you are pursuing purpose, one of the things you should have, you should know at the, at the front of your mind, at the back of your mind, center all around your mind is that people will have their misunderstandings about you and people will, will not know you. Some of the time it's even more painful when even the closest ones don't know you. When those are meant to be the closest to you, they don't still know you. One of the things that every man craves for is to be known are we together scripture says to be known as we have known everyone wants to be known and when people when you are not known 
So yes, you have your self-esteem is in place, but it still, it still has a, a, an impact on you as an individual. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. So, so Jesus was not known by his people. John was not known. <laughs> Amen. Now, this makes us understand that the people did not know he who came to restore all things. Are we together? Now, so they didn't know he who came to restore all things. They didn't know who had come to restore all things. They knew him as John the Baptist, the prophet, but they didn't know him as the one who came to restore what? All things. Praise God forevermore. Now, since they didn't know who came to restore all things, how then would they expect or experience restoration? Now, this is a very important thing. I'm talking from experience in life and in ministry. I'm talking from serious experience in life and in ministry. Now, you see a lot of people have expectations, but they don't even know where they are to get the expectation from. Are you getting what I'm saying? And that's one of the blindfolds of the enemy. That's one of the blindfolds of the devil. He makes you have an expectation, but not make you know where you can get your expectation met. Are you getting what I'm saying? And you see situations of people, they fight their, their, their friend and help their enemy. Those are, you see, when you see such kind of thing, just understand that it's because they don't know who the friend is. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, I, I, at the stage of my life, I thought I had friends. I really thought I had friends. But now, um, somebody was always telling me, you don't have friends, so. but I really thought I had friends. But later on in my life, I actually discovered that I don't have friends. Now, it was a shocking discovery. It was a painful discovery. And um, it took me time to digest that discovery. And, um, but I finally digested it because I came to understand that all the people I claimed to be friends actually didn't know me. And they didn't even care to know me. Are we together? And so I was actually wasting my time for vision on the people. Now, a lot of people who actually um, um, uh, 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 around me or people that might have known me in the past, if you get to talk with many of them, they may have a lot of misconceptions about me. Some of them may have a lot of things about me. Now, the reason for that is because I actually later discovered that even they thought they knew, but they didn't know. And so I came to accept truth that, as a wise man said, as you live in life, if you can end up having one friend, you are blessed. <laughs> are we together? We are blessed. Because most of the time, even the people we call friends, they don't know us. That's one of the greatest irony of life. And that's why the first thing a man must do is to seek to know God and then to know himself. Because people will not know you. Everybody comes to meet you for what he wants to get from you. Not because they really want to know you. And you get what I'm saying? Praise God for everyone. That's a general approach to us. So you discover that the people did not know the carrier of restoration, the bringer of what? The restoration, the one who was to restore all things. They didn't know him. And yet they were expecting restoration. And how will you get it? Amen. Now, it's, so, it, it, it's unfortunate that the same predicament that plagued, you know, um, um, the people of Israel then is the same predicament plaguing a lot of acclaimed followers of Jesus. They are expecting so much for Jesus, but they actually do not know Jesus. Now, the same question Jesus asked Peter, who do men say I am? Jesus asked the same question in his church today. Who do men say I am? When I'm talking about, he's talking about men, he's not talking about outsiders, he's talking about the insiders. Are you getting what I'm saying? His own that are meant to be his beloved. He still asks them, Who do you say I am? Now, a lot of people have a lot of understanding about Jesus, but they do not really know Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? A lot of people have a lot of misconception about Jesus, a lot of ideologies about you, but they don't really know Jesus. Praise God forevermore. Now, so it, 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 it's painful that what plagued the Jews then is plaguing the church today. And because we lack this knowledge, we still keep crying and having expectation for all things to be restored, and yet it's not being restored. They desperately need, you see, a lot of people desperately need and expect restoration, but they do not know and do not desire to know the bringer of restoration. Are you getting what I'm saying? So a lot of people desperately need expectation uh, restoration, they desperately desire restoration, but they don't know the bringer of restoration, they don't know the one who brings the restoration. So it's amazing that at the end of the day, they are desiring it, but you don't know the one who brings it. Just like you say, I, I, need, I, need, I need somebody to give me um, uh, um, 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 a gift, a car, or whatever, 
and the person comes and he's the one to give you the car and you, he comes to your house and he um, tells you, oh, for, let me say for example you ordered for a car and um, they, they sent um, 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 the, 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 the salesperson to come and deliver the product to you, order for a product and the salesperson comes to your house and then he knocks at your door and you look at him and you, he says, oh, please I have a delivery for you and, he, I, and you begin to look, where is, the, where is the person who is to deliver it? And he say, I'm the one, so he says, no, 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 you are not the one I'm expecting to deliver this product to me. I'm expecting someone, that's what is happening in the church. I'm expecting someone else to deliver the product. But he says, no, this is the company, this is the invoice, this is everything to show that I'm the one who is to deliver. I say, no, 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 yes, this is the company, fine, but you are not the one I'm expecting to deliver. And that's been the confusion in the church of Jesus today. We are so desperate, we are so desperate. You see Christians pray, you see Christians cry, you see Christians jump, you see Christians shout. They need the restoration of all things. But they do not know the one who brings the restoration. The same challenge that plagued the children of Israel in the time of John the Baptist is the same challenge plaguing the church today. It's so painful that today you come and I, I, this is a ministry location where we came and we began to show people love. And in response to the love, it was hatred they showed us. And I began to wonder what kind of people think backward like this that when they see love, they fight love. When they see genuity, they fight it. But when they see fake, they are self-fake. Are you getting what I'm saying? Over the years, in my work with God in ministry, I've seen that people like it fake. People like when you lie to them. People like when you deceive them. When you come out plain and blunt, when you come out straight, when you come out sincere, when you show integrity, they don't like it. They like deception. And that's the reason why, when they see the truth, they don't know the truth. Because they've been so used to deception. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now in verse 12, Jesus told the disciples that Elijah had come already. Now how did Elijah come? How did Elijah come? Let's look at verse um, uh, 13. He says, Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them about John the Baptist. So the disciples understand, understood that the coming of Elijah again was in the person of what? John the Baptist. Even the disciples understood but the scribes and Pharisees that were speaking didn't understand. I get what I'm saying. The people did not understand. That's why they did not know Elijah when he came. <laughs> I get what I'm saying. And most of the times we need to understand that what we seek, it comes in a way that we don't expect. Elijah in the time of old wore a, 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 a cloak, he wore a cloth and he wore a mantle and he, he, he walked, you know, though a prophet, but he walked like a normal man. But this John the Baptist was eating white locusts and honey and wearing animal skin. He was a caveman to them. How can Elijah come in a prehistoric form? Most of the time when God gives you a package, sometimes it doesn't look packaged. Like they say, gold always comes in raw packages. Most of the times, a lot of Christians have lost their packages because they were expecting it to be more beautiful, more polished, more organized, more, 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 more structured than it looked. Elijah in his time was more civilized in his dressing in court. Are you getting what I'm saying? But when Elijah came back, he went to Stone Age in dressing. That means what? He went back to the Garden of Eden because it was the Garden of Eden that God sold animal skin and gave to Adam and Eve to wear. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, so when Elijah was on the earth, he was walking with the clothes that he wore and he wore a mantle at the same time, praise God forevermore. But when Elijah returned, he returned with, with the Eden clothing. Now, why did God do it like that? One of the reasons why God did it like that was because God was telling them, my purpose for sending Elijah again is to restore all things. And from the beginning to also, I want to restore things back. I'm taking you back because you need to see where you fell from so I can bring you forward. Amen to Jesus. So this means that John the Baptist was Elias returned again, but not in the same physical form and fashion because John definitely did not look like Elijah physically. But it was, it was Elijah returned again, not in the same world, physical form and fashion. Now, if John the Baptist was Elijah returned again, does it mean that he was the incarnate of Elijah? Now, because I believe this is a question that will be bugging our minds. Amen to Jesus. I remember a while ago I was studying on this line and I left it again. Amen. Because I was studying on the spirit of Elijah and I left it. And in the course of this teaching, I knew that I had to attack it. Because I can't keep believing it. Many of us have heard of the issues of incarnation, incarnation, oh, he has come back. In the Yoruba language, Baba Tunde, Iya, 
he had body or whatever. Now, so the father has come back again. The mother has come back. We've heard about things of incarnation. And some people believe that, you know, uh, when the Bible says John the Baptist was Elias come again, that it speaks about incarnation. Amen to Jesus. Now, so does the Bible support human incarnation? We have to, we're going through this because it's going to get us to somewhere that is very interesting and important. Amen to Jesus. Now, in order to get the answer to this question, we must first understand what incarnation means. Amen. What incarnation means. Now, the Merah Webster Dictionary defines incarnate as, number one, ha or having a human body. Having a human body. That is to say, one invested with human body and especially human nature and form. Number two, made manifest or comprehensible. That is to say, embodied. Embodied. Are we together? Now, according to the principles of the Bible, the concept of incarnation is ruled at when death has taken place. Because incarnation is talking about here having a human body. Being manifest in a human body. Are you getting me? That's what incarnation talks about. Amen. So, in, like I say, a spirit has taken a human body and come back again. Praise God forevermore. Are we together? Now, according to scriptures, the concept of incarnation is ruled out when death has taken place. That is to say, when a man dies, he cannot come back to earth again. Why? Because judgment is next for him. You don't die and come. You die and get judgment. Wherever the judgment um, is, is taking you to, that's a cup of tea. You don't die and come back. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, as, And as it is appointed unto man, men wants to die, but after this, the judgment wants to die. Once death happens, the next thing is judgment, not, not coming back again. The, 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 the doorway is closed. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now this means that when a man does not die, he is still a man with a human body, human nature, and human form. As such, he cannot put on another human body nature and form when he already has one. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, when a man dies, his judgment next. He has become a spirit, his judgment next. But when a man does not die, he still has what? A human body. He has a human nature, he has a human form. He cannot put on another human body, another uh, or nature or form on an existing one. Are you getting what I'm saying? It doesn't work, it cannot happen. Praise the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now so, with respect to the person under consideration, Elias, he was taken to heaven alive. Remember, he was taken to heaven alive. That means he did not die. Thus, he carried along his human body, his human nature and form. Praise God. As such, he cannot put on another human body. How <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Now, why is Christ in us, in the person of his Holy Spirit, when Jesus left, said, I, was, I pray the Father and he will send me a comforter? Why? Because Jesus went to heaven with a glorified body. In heaven, Jesus has um, flesh and bone, no blood. Are you getting what I'm saying? He poured out all his blood on the cross. He emptied it all. So he has flesh and bone, no blood. He has a glorified human body there. Though he can pass through walls and he can, uh, he can, he, where he was, before, in 40 days, where he was on it before he ascended, you could see that he passed through walls. He could, he could still eat. He could pass through But it negates operations of the supernatural for him to come and stay in another human body. Are you getting what I'm saying? But Elias' case is much different from Jesus' case. Elias went in his body, with his body to heaven. Are you getting what I'm saying? The body is there. The nature is there. How it's staying there? I cannot explain. Don't ask me to explain, but it is there. Are you getting me? So because he still has a human body there, he cannot put on another human body. Even Jesus obeyed the protocols of the supernatural by ensuring that he has to go and send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Son, the Holy Spirit, to come and indwell us. Only Spirit indwell bodies. Are you getting me? But Jesus, when he had a glorified body, says, no, I will not break the order and the protocol. I will go to heaven and send, and the Father will send the Spirit. He will come and indwell. He is me. I am him. He is a paracletos, a comforter of another kind. We are all the same. But he is the spirit of the Father. He indwells us. So Elias is there with his body. And so he cannot put on another human body, another human nature, another form. Praise God forevermore. And 
and since he, he already possesses a human body, he cannot put it on. Thus, John the Baptist was not Elias incarnate. He was not the incarnate of Elijah. Are you getting what I'm saying? Also, it only takes a spirit who cannot die to be invested with, you, with bodily and especially human nature and form and be made manifest or what? Comprehensible. It only takes a spirit that cannot die to be what? Invested with human body or human nature and human form. But Elias was not the spirit. He left it his human body. Are you getting what I'm saying? So he cannot be invested with another human body. So John the Baptist was not the incarnate of Elias. Now, this was another thing why it was also difficult for them to explain, to, 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 to know Elias when he returned. Now, when they, say, when they say things like he has incarnated, it's because you see that, ah, the child so resembles his grandfather. They say this one is the incarnate of his father. He resembles the grandfather. So they can say it's the incarnate of his father. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, so they can easily say, ah, this one is, 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 is his father returned, which actually, like we have seen, it doesn't work. It's not, it's not workable in the, in the supernatural and in the operations of the kingdom of God. Now, so when the scribes said Elias will come, they were expecting Elias to come as in quote and incarnate. He will look like him already. He will be the same form and the same fashion. But we have seen that from the operations of the scriptures, it was not possible. So when Elias came again and it was a different form, are you getting me? They couldn't know him. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, was the incarnate of God the Father because God the Father, who is spirit that cannot die was invested with human body and especially human nature and form and made manifest or comprehensible in the person of his son jesus but that's why jesus is the incarnate of the father are you get what i'm saying now it is a spirit that cannot die the father is the spirit the bible says god is spirit and then i worship him most worship in spirit and truth god is spirit and he has a spirit are you get what i'm saying and he was invested with human nature in the person of his son jesus John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 and verse 14 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word was, 13 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Are we together? So we see that Jesus was incarnate of the Father because God is spirit and a spirit that and is a spirit is a spirit of spirits, a spirit that cannot die. He invested himself in a human body and he came in the person of his son. Are you getting what I'm saying? But when a spirit, when a, a spirit dies, a, a human being, sorry, dies, he the next thing is judgment for him. He cannot go on putting on a human another human body again. And then number three. When a person still has a body, he cannot invest himself with another word, body. So we get to understand the technicalities here. Now, if John was not the incarnate of Elias, why did Jesus call John Elias who came back? If he was not the incarnate of Elias, why did he call him Elias who came back? Now, Jesus called John Elias who came back because John carried the same assignment with Elias. The same assignment with Elias. What was the assignment? The assignment was to restore all men back to God. The same assignment. This was the same task Elias carried out which led to him slaughtering the 450 prophets of Baal after accomplishing this task. Temporary, because it was actually temporary, because the restoration mandate, had, it, it didn't end in Elijah, it didn't end in John the Baptist. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, another reason why we also know that it did also end in Elijah is because the, 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 the children of Israel also pursued God again after Elijah. Praise God forevermore. Now, so, he, Elijah came with this restoration mandate, and then, the same tax John the Baptist came with. When Elias, when, when Elijah achieved his task by context, are you get what I'm saying? You see that he came and he achieved the task. He achieved it by context. He said, okay, we go to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be studying this uh, in the course of these um, uh, 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 meetings. 1 Kings chapter 19, he told Ahab, he said, all right, let's go get a context. Let Baal bring, let the prophets of Baal come and let them call on Baal. And then I'm going to call on, uh, uh, um, on the Lord, God Almighty. And whosoever God answers with fire, let that be God. Amen to Jesus. Now, so he came with a context. He achieved his task with what? With a context. Now, we must understand something that God allows operations and God 
operate in different diverse ways. Now, the operations of the Old Testament may not basically fit into the New Testament, but it doesn't mean that they are obsolete. Are you getting what I'm saying? There are times where God may lift, may allow some operate. Are you getting me? Now, we can see that in the Old Testament, Elijah achieved his tax by contest. Amen. Why John the Baptist came and achieved his own tax by pointing and looking to Jesus. Now, the ultimate goal was what? To restore all men back to God. Are we getting what I'm saying? But in the Old Testament, Elijah achieved his own by contest. And in the New Testament, John the Baptist achieved his own by what? Pointing and looking to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I went together. And now this was another reason why the people did not know Elijah when he came back. Because the Elijah they knew achieved his restoration mandate by contest. But this Elijah is achieving his own by what? Pointing to Jesus. And see, this is why sometimes it's so difficult. You see that the church of Jesus could be so dogmatic. When God begins to, let me use the word, change his procedure, we, be, we stick to the old and we are so used to the old that we are not moving with the spirit of God. Now one of the things I've learned in my work with God in the ministry is to move with the cloud, to move with the spirit. When you become so rigid and so dogmatic, you cannot be led by the spirit. And you cannot achieve great feet for the Lord. I remember when it looks like they have closed up every door of ministry for me in this country. The enemy came all out, the people came all out to fight. You see, when you come into a location and what they want to do is to fight you. When it looked like everybody was out to fight me, let's empty the church. Let's ensure that they run out of town. You know, they just when you just come, they just want to ensure they run you out of town. But when they closed all those doors, the Lord opened the door of the media. And we began to do what we are doing today. And suddenly, God began to open more doors. But if I said, oh, the devil won. They, they emptied the whole church. They carried their people away from church. I cannot preach again. I'm closing church. And if I told that serious that I, 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 somebody was asking, are you still there? And that person asked, are you, ask, um, Pastor, are you still there? You know, and um, uh, 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 somebody kept on sending threats. He was removing the people from the church. His vision was, I will frustrate them. But I thank God. At the end of the day, he got frustrated. Why? Because you cannot put God in a box. Now, the reason why they did not know Elias when he came again was because the, the, the strategy of Elias now was different from the strategy of before. Elias came before with a contest, but Elias came again by pointing. Elias came before by calling fire down. Elias came again by calling the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? They only knew the contest method or strategy. They did not know the pointing to Jesus strategy. And you see, what are one of the challenges that the church is having today? We still are used to the contest method. I'm telling you, we are still so used to the contest. When we talk about preaching Jesus, revealing Jesus, revealing Jesus, there are people who are still arguing it today. Yeah. I, I, I heard somebody say, don't preach Jesus. Preach the word, I like, preach the word of Jesus. I'm like, what? I don't understand what you're saying. I should not preach Jesus. I should preach the word of Jesus. I don't understand, I, I don't understand it. Now, because all those are the Elijah Contest strategy. Are you hearing something? They have become so used to contest strategy that they don't understand the preach Jesus strategy, the point of Jesus strategy. Are you getting me? Elias came the next time and he knew that he was not meant to do what? Use the contest. The first time the train of Israel, when they needed water, God told Moses, Take your rod, strike the rock. He struck the rock and the rock brought forth water. The next time they needed water, he told Moses, speak to the rock. See, if you tie yourself to the ancient dogmatic words of the Lord, and you're not moving with the words of the Lord per time, you end up dishonoring God before the people. He struck the rock. And God said, speak. He struck. And God told him, you have dishonored me before the people. Why? You must be sensitive to my strategies per time. Even David knew that you cannot fight battles by holding on to old strategies. Are you getting what I'm saying? When he fought with Goliath, he used the sling, shot and the stone. 
But when he became an army, a, a soldier, he dropped his slingshot and his sword and started using the sword. If he kept hold, if he held on to the sling and said he wanted to keep using sling method, he, they would have killed him in battle. I get what I'm saying. Number two, when he wins, every time he wants to go to war, he asks the Lord, Lord, where do we take? Do we take the mountain or do we take the valley? Because you know that for every new battle, there is a new strategy. And until you walk with the move of the Spirit, per time, you will never attain consistent victories. The problem the church has is that we are still using the contest method when God has long left it and he's at what? The pointing to Jesus method. I remember preaching here at over and somebody asked me and I said, God does not speak to prophets in the New Testament. And I said, and I taught the, the people once each other. Somebody, he had heard it, he asked me again. I showed him Hebrew chapter 1 verse 1. God who had sundry times, sundry many, means many times, God who had sundry times in the past, spoke to our father through prophets, had in this time spoken through, and in, as in the last days, spoken through his son Jesus. What is there to understand again? God does not speak through prophets in the New Testament. He only confirms his word through prophets. So if you are not hearing his words, and you are going to hear God from a prophet, you are going to have a problem. Because God speaks Jesus. Jesus is the spoken word of God. He's all he speaks now. He only speaks through Jesus. Every other person is to confirm Jesus. If you are not confirming Jesus, they are prophets of God. If they are not confirming Jesus, they are prophets of doom. They are not confirming Jesus, they are prophets of their own belly. And if you are not hearing Jesus, and you go to meet somebody to confirm, anything they give you, take it like that. The strategy change from contest to what? Pointing to Jesus. <laughs> and that's why you see the church is so, I look at the church of and I like laugh. Every, especially in this location, everybody is a prophet. Young prophet, prophet one, prophet two, prophet three, prophet four, prophet five. Everybody's prophet, and everybody's prophet. Everybody's prophet. Everybody's saying, I see. Everybody's saying, I hear. Everybody's saying, there's some. Everybody wants to. Everybody wants to see and hear. And I'm like, wow, what a generation. We are still going back to the larger generation. We are still using the content. That's why I said that they have to use gimmicks and, 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 and drama to get people's attention. But John the Baptist was only speaking about what? The coming of what? The one who the lashes of his last the list of issues on what he told time. And because his strategy was not a, the first Elijah strategy, the people did not see know who Elijah was this time around. I get what I'm saying. The same assignment, but a different strategy. And you know, this is the same predicament that plagued Israel, and it's the same predicament that is plaguing the church today. We do not know restoration. We do not know. Why don't we know restoration? Because we don't know that restoration comes by pointing and looking to Jesus now. We still only know the old faced away type of restoration that comes by contest. That's why you see. You see, sometimes they say, you, you, you see people, they want to pray. I'm not against it. I pray. I'm a man of prayer by the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying I pray too much, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying. You understand what I'm saying? But I heard a particular miss of going spirit. There was one day she tried to pray for one hour stretch. Said after five minutes, she discovered that. She didn't have anything to say. But you know what? That minister of the gospel, she's, I think in the women's, uh, globally, she's the biggest women minister. And she said she cannot pray for one hour stretch. Are you getting upset? And I mean, she's making impact. I encourage praying long hours. But when you look at her, you discover that what she has more is relationship. Yesterday we studied in church about that, Abba Father. What she has more with God is relationship. And what was six months relationship? Because relationship makes you pray without ceasing. Are you getting me? Relationship takes you to a place of fellowship where you pray without ceasing. But when you don't have a relationship with God, when you have what they call a touch and go relationship, you always do the fire brigade approach. Want to get God's attention at every given point in time. We live in a generation that keeps looking for contests, but we don't want to point to Jesus. And we have been so used to the contest strategy that when we come saying, let's point to Jesus, we don't understand what we're saying. People don't understand any longer. 
You have people who can preach for long hours, but they will preach on different things, but you will not see Jesus glorified in the preaching. We have people who can pray for hours, but when you pray, look at their prayer lines, it's, it, it's not centered on Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? And that's the plague of the church today. Our plague is that we are still focused on the contest approach, not on the pointing to Jesus approach. And God brought Elijah a second time to make us understand what we are to be doing now. Yeah. I get what I'm saying. Remember, we learned that the Bible says that um, in the list of the king, um, John the Baptist, the greatest prophet that ever existed, Jesus was speaking, saying, But the list in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. How will we be greater than John the Baptist? It's by continuing from where we stop. What did John the Baptist do? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of men. If John the Baptist was pointing at Jesus, what, why should we be pointing at any on it? Why should we be doing any other thing? If John the Baptist was pointing at Jesus, why should we be seeking contest? We never heard that John the Baptist was prophesying in the way I forget what I'm saying. His whole prophetic ministry was channeled to Jesus. I, I, are you getting me? John the Baptist was an example of the New Testament prophet. Yeah. That's why he was just the last prophet before the New Testament began. It was God trying to make us understand who the New Testament prophet. New Testament prophet is not to come and see people's cases and yeah, I, I, by the grace of God, I function in the prophetic gift, word of knowledge, where God permits you to do, permits to do. But that is not the purpose of the New Testament prophet. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the gift of revelation, and those are what you combine together and call the prophetic today because they all function in that light. Whether you're a prophet to nation, prophet to your family, prophet to whatever. It's all functioning that it's word of knowledge, word of uh, uh, the gift of uh, revelation and the They are all coming together to function in the prophetic ministry. Uh, praise God. But now the prophetic ministry of the new creation, of the New Testament, is not to tell people this and tell people that or, 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 or the plenty of things we are seeing today. The prophetic ministry of the New Testament is to point people to Jesus. Once Jesus is the focus, I tell you, every other thing is set in place. But they did not recognize Elias because they were still expecting him to come and tell them, according to my word, there shall be no rain three and a half years. Okay, bring the prophet of God, let us kill them. That is why some people have still been killing and killing and killing, and yet they are not achieving that sweet fellowship with the Lord. The purpose of the New Testament prophet is to point to Jesus. They did not recognize Elijah because they were still looking for contest. That is why today we don't recognize Jesus. We don't recognize Jesus because we are still looking for some old things. Jesus said the same way they treated John, they also, they also treat me. And it was the same thing. That's the reason why we don't even recognize when God is doing the restoration package. We don't understand when God is on the restoration move. Why? Because we are still looking for contest. I have people say, like in my country, they say, Ah, where are the men of God? Where are the prophets of old? Can we not have men of God that can just decree and all the evil in the nation we end? That was Elijah's strategy. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? That was Elijah's strategy. But is that John the Baptist's strategy? Don't forget that in, a, in Elijah's time, Elijah came and said, I'm calling for my word, I shall be done for three and a half years. And it was so. And Ahab was looking for him, and he came to chase the Ahab, and they did the, and they did the content, and they killed the prophet about wonderful, beautiful. But in John the Baptist's time, John the Baptist was shouting in the wilderness. We were coming to meet him in the wilderness. But yet, he, the, the, the Herod still married his, his, his brother's wife. And that was what even led to the death of John the Baptist. And he said, but why was John the Baptist killed and Elijah was not killed? Because you must understand something. That the New Testament move of, Christ, of God is to reveal Jesus. Focus on Jesus and not on the politics and everything happening. That was where John the Baptist had a little issue in his, in his ministry. His ministry was, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of God. Are you getting what I'm saying? That was his ministry. Focus on it. When he drifted a little to political issues, it costed him his head. And you are saying, are we not meant to be involved in politics? There are people in the kingdom to be involved. They are the shoulder region. The government shall be upon the shoulder. They are the shoulder. Let them go inside there. We'll pray for them to <laughs> we'll pray for them and empower them spiritually. If they can take the, 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 the blows, then they should go there. But what is our job here? Our job is to do what? Showcase Jesus. He said, but what? No prophet. We are, we are not having Elijah. 
Elijah came again. No? How did he come? He came again by pointing to Jesus. It's an example to us. We should keep pointing. I remember the point in the mountain, Lord, all I'm going through ministry. What is the matter? God speak to me. And in the night, uh, in the night, in a dream, I, 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 I saw a particular verse of scripture and I heard a particular verse of scripture. I came out and I read the scripture and it was a book of Corinthians. And it was all talking about preaching Jesus. And I God is uh, God said, keep preaching Jesus. How will it make sense? I don't know. But Jesus said, he told the father, I said, if you lift me up, I will do what? I will draw all men. The more Jesus is exalted, we understood that the awakening in the church will be arouded by the transfiguration. Now what is the transfiguration? For Jesus to shine. For Jesus, for us to glorify Jesus on our altars. For us to glorify Jesus in our churches. For men to be reduced and for Christ to increase. Jesus, Apostle Paul said that, this, that, Christ, that I may decrease, that he may increase. For Christ to keep radiating, for Christ to keep being glorified, for Christ to keep being increased in everything we do. The awakening will come in the church. Now for the restoration of all things, it will be eroded by we. As we are pointing to Jesus within, we begin to point to him without. As that happens, all things will be restored. So the same predicament that plagued the Israelites, plagued the church today. We do not know restoration comes only by pointing and looking to Jesus now. We still only know the old face away type of restoration, which comes by contest. And that's why we are still looking for contest here, contest here, show off here, show off there, um, program here, program there. Uh, what else again? Like a man of God said, said you know they now have what they call smoky face. They bring the smoky face in church. It is called a cardboard. Lost glory. We have removed the real thing and we are now putting the fake. Contest here, contest there. But, the, 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 but Christ is not being revealed. Until we know Elias in John the Baptist. That is to say, restoration by looking and pointing to Jesus, we cannot enjoy restoration. Until we know Elias in John the Baptist, child of God, we cannot enjoy what restoration. Restoration comes only by pointing and looking to Jesus. He said, Jesus said, he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I don't know who is under the sound of my voice today, and you are eager for restoration. You are going to pray. You are going to pray. But before we pray, I want to pray for everyone under the sound of my voice who has not made Jesus their Lord and personal Savior. You want to pray this prayer with me. I encourage you to do it. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, today I come to you. I know that I'm a sinner, and you died for me over 2,000 years ago. You shed your blood to take away my sins. Jesus, I choose you today. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for choosing me. I make you my Lord and personal Savior. And I choose to serve and follow you all the days of my life. Lord, thank you for everyone who has made this prayer. Thank you for receiving them in the beloved. And thank you then for granting them, them the grace to serve and follow you. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, in the name of Jesus. You are going to pray one prayer. You are going to pray, Lord, I receive grace to only point and look unto Jesus. To not look for contest, but to point and look unto Jesus. You know, somebody is praying that prayer this morning. Rikadosh Iblatandri Abatosa. Eliadabaswa Palanda. Repriketis Kobolumbia Palanda. Le supracanti ada la baria tolanta. Repriege de lebe sua parata. Le ikadosh ibracatua parata. Rebelebe bebede shabala babadosh. Repriege de lebe bebede belia talada. Iklandos ibrada lia dabata. Repriege de lebe bebede su. Ibrege dia talada. Eplike scubreke de shadalada. Christ only point and look to Jesus. Etia brande ni mosi ani ne boki avalata. Repriege de lebe bebede su. Palata, Reprigado si balandri gedesha, Reprigede sua balada nada, Ibragado si apelenda, Repriege di galadi cadodosa, Repequila polia tali galata, Reprege de le voti abalata, Reprege de le bebe di apurunda, Repriege de le bacua palata, Le isco baliata baria babadasha, Repre de le begresu, only point and look unto Jesus. I receive such grace in the name of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. God, we pray for the sick. Whenever you're sick in your body, just put your, your, your left hand on that part and lift up your right hand. And we're going to be, let's connect our faith together and let's trust God for healings. Amen to Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone sick in their body. I cause sicknesses and diseases. We unite our faith together and we cause tumors. Amen. We cause fibroids. Amen. We cause kidney stones. Amen. We, co we, 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 we cause every kind of inflammation. Amen. We cause disorders. Amen. We cause 
and retrogressions. Amen. We cause swellings. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We cause blockages. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We decree the healing power. Pains of every kind. We curse you. Amen. We decree the healing power of Jesus into bodies now. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I cause every form of satanic oppression. Yes, and I decree the deliverance power of the world into everyone possessed by devils. Amen. Be free now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I decree health and vitality. Amen. Everyone believing God for a miracle of any kind, I decree your miracles locate you. Amen. I decree so, and so it is in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. Bless God for another time in his presence. Once again, tomorrow is another time. Join in and the Lord bless you. God bless you. Great see you.